Steph, let's post that on the on the website and Facebook because that's video's been around a long time, but it's one of the most powerful videos I think that um we we ever show here. It doesn't have a lot to do with this morning's message outside. They quoted Luke four twenty two and we'll be reading in that passage here. Um and you can turn to the book of Luke if you have your Bibles, chapter four. <clears throat> Every person here this morning, every person living on planet Earth will experience loss and grief. Not all, you might not experience trauma, but you will experience loss and grief. It cannot be avoided. Some of it will be considered normal loss, yet it will still be very difficult. What's a normal loss? It's a loss of maybe of a parent that's lived a long life and they, they pass from this life into the next. They, that would be a normal loss. Doesn't mean it's an easy loss, it's just it's a normal loss. It's an, it's an expected loss. And because that's an expected loss, no matter how expected it is, it's a, a normal cause of grief that happens. And we're not, let me just stop here for a moment. Um, I've left a big portion of this message out um, this morning because I, it would just take too much time. In fact, I, I never even got through what the portion I did want to get through. We'll we'll continue this message again. I hate doing this. I've done it to you two times in a month. We'll continue this message on Wednesday night because Wednesday night we're going to start, even though there may not be this Wednesday, it may be. I'm not figuring how far we go this morning. Um, We want to show a grief loss um, um, seminar by Dr. Norman Wright. It's It's about six sessions. Each session is no more than a half hour long. We'll be open for discussion. I'll be here to, fo- to f- you know, format discussion after. You can catch that live on the web. If you can't be here, we'll do our best to film them and have them um, posted if we can't figure out how we can do that. I think we can probably pull that off. And um, so you don't miss any of these. In <clears throat> what happened in our church, if I can speak so candidly, and I will be speaking very transparently all morning to you, um, when losing my daughter, um, February 12th, the accident happened here on the property. Um, I wasn't in that room when everything happened. I was actually in this room when, that, when everything happened. It was a, a tremendous amount of trauma took place in a lot of people's lives. I mean, and it was different for everybody. It was different from every level, from being at the hospital, from being actually in the actual bay when 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 everything happened. Um, to all the things that followed, and it, it impacted everyone at a different level, depending on how close you were, depending on who you are, your background, your relationship with, with Hannah, your relationship with me. It impacted everybody to a certain level. And one of the things that I think we might be a little amiss at, I was, and I don't condemn myself for it, was understanding and dealing through my own loss. I didn't really think of yours that much. A little bit, but not enough. <laughs> so what I want to do is I want to I want to speak this message to you this morning to help you maybe understand losses in your own life, and then I want to continue this thought for the next probably six or seven Wednesdays. I'm guessing it's going to be seven Wednesdays. Now I know some of you can't make it on Wednesday, but um, but we'll have that's why we have the website. Thank, thank God for technology. Thank God for the uh, thank for Al Gore and the web, and um, thank God because where would we be without it? And, um, and we, have, we have the web, so you can actually go on and see these things on YouTube and things like that and through our website. So we'll make sure you, you don't miss it. And if you're here listening and you don't, I don't have a computer, we'll send you a DVD. We do that, too. Some folks are refusing to get a computer because of outward rebellion. And, uh, and um, so we'll, we'll get you, we'll get you um, a something so you can make sure that you watch it. <laughs> now, some of this loss is considered diff- uh, normal but difficult. Losing a parent, again, considered normal. Um, But then there's sometimes is what we call great losses. And while there are many factors in how great loss is, loss needs to be processed. Somebody said to somebody in relation to the the incident with my daughter, he goes, well, now you just got to get busy. Busy is trying to catch smoke in a box. Busy doesn't help anything. Busy ignores things and will find its way out of that box some other way. Busy doesn't help. Busy just helps you not pay attention for a while. And I I venture to say, if I can be so bold, the generation before my my father's generation was great at just staying busy, but never really dealing with the issues of life at hand as they invaded. My generation's a little bit better at it. The generation coming after me, well, you're in serious trouble. Because I was the last really good generation that that there was. 
<laughs> and just kidding, because <clears throat> I need your Social Security, so get to work. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Where was I before I got distracted? Um, so, so I, I, we don't, we don't, um, can't ignore loss. Now, for me to say here and tell you, I'm going to teach you all about loss today and how you process it and how you deal with it, I'd be totally lying to you. I don't know exactly how you deal with great loss and trauma in your life. I, I'm, I'm, it's. For me to tell you that I, I did would be like me drawing a map out of the woods while I'm still in the woods. I don't know how to get out of the woods. But I can describe the trees. I can tell you what the trees look like and what the woods feel like. And some of you might be in the woods too, and some of you might have passed through the woods in your life, and maybe you have a better map at this than me, but I thought the very least I'd like to do today is give you a snapshot of the woods, because all I see, my friends, are trees. Now, in, in this passage in Luke chapter 4, Jesus is making a strong proclamation for his Messiahship. He's quoting Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, because... We didn't, he didn't have that numbered out back then. He just found it in a scroll. And he was revealing the scope and the purpose of his gospel. And that's important, as we'll get back to that in a moment. Luke 4, verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of Isaiah. And when he had opened the book... He found the place where it was written. So he took the scroll. There's a scroll, not a book. He found Isaiah 61. There's, just, of course, no 61 there at that point. And he read these verses. These are verses for the Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, Recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are bruised. Let me stop there for a moment. Now, preach the gospel to the poor. Now, is that poor economically? Yeah, I think that probably does mean poor economically, but I also think it means, Matthew chapter 5, poor in spirit. I think there's some physical things that he's referring to and some parallel um, psychological, emotional um, physiological things that he's, he's, he's referring to here. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. I look up the word brokenhearted in the Greek New Testament, and it just means brokenhearted. <laughs> Thought I'd share that with you. There's two words. One means broken, and one means heart. Broken heart. <laughs> that was deep. No. no. It means to, to preach deliverance to the captives. Now, does that just mean a prison ministry? Possibly, yes. I mean, it means that to a point. But could that mean, and probably more, more directly means captive to something on the inside? People in bondage to something on the inside, maybe an addiction, maybe a bad event in their past, trauma in their past. They're captive. Recovering the sight of the blind. Physical blindness? Yeah, and so see in the Gospels, we see lots of physical blindness healed, but could that be more spiritual blindness? Or a blindness of not seeing our blind spots, maybe? Not seeing what God is really doing and why he's done it? And to send, set at liberty them that are bruised. Again, physically, yeah. Emotionally, spiritually, I think more applicable. Verse 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Referring to the year of Jubilee when all debts were canceled. It was a year of Jubilee when if I, in the Bible times, if I had an economic hard time, I'd take my son, let's say, and I'd take my son, I'd, I'd mortgage him, or a brother or a sister, and I'd, I'd, I'd just sort of pawn him. It's like a pawn shop, like pawn stars. This, I just go. I pawn a family off as a slave, and they would, and they would. I'd get money so I could pay my bills, I, or I'd, I'd take myself and be a slave to another family, and and, and so they, if I owed them a debt, 
Well, every, I think it's every 49 years, right? 50 years, the year of Jubilee, they would um, erase all debts. All debts would be eliminated. They were free. Let me read you that verse in the Amplified Bible. To proclaim the accepted and acceptable year of the Lord, the day when salvation and free favors of God are profusely abounded. Cool. So he says, I've, I have a message. My gospel is to the poor. My gospel is to the brokenhearted. My gospel is to the captives. My gospel is to the blind. My gospel is to the bruised. How does that work? I think it all comes from that, that cross. What does that cross do? Does, does it magically come in and just touch the things of our heart and make them different? There's no magic involved in it. What the cross has done is created you and I, given everyone in the human race an opportunity to have a personal, intimate, viable, healing relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's in that relationship that we have with Jesus Christ that grows throughout our lifetime. It grows in truth. It grows in commitment. It grows in, 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 in the Lord to making him the Lord of our life, as we'll see today. That, that, that lifelong relationship is the thing that, very he, that heals the poor, heals the brokenhearted, sets free the captives, gives sight to the blind, and liberty for those who are bruised. The answer is found in our relationship with God. Sometimes I think we make a misnomer, we make a mistake, and sometimes I think folks maybe misrepresent Christianity when they, they sort of give Christianity the zap mode. You're a Christian, wait for the zapping. <laughs> and, and, and if you're just waiting, and then all my, all my issues go away, all my addictions go away, all my problems go away. And, and sometimes God uses the zap mode. Sometimes. I've seen God zap plenty of people in good ways, but usually it's this process of knowing God, drawing near to God, making Him more dear to your heart, hiding His Word deep in your heart, believing His promises, practicing His promises, developing a relationship through prayer and the Word. That's when I find real healing begins to take place in people's lives. Let's talk about some things that will, will, it's going to impact everyone in here. If you're three years old and you're in nursery, this is going to impact you someday. Loss. Loss is the heart of crisis and trauma. But loss is far more encompassing theme in our life. Everyone's going to endure loss. Not everyone will endure trauma. Even though many will and don't even know that they do. It's not just losing through death even though that's the primary way that we relate to it. But loss is also by leaving and being left. A child abandoned by a parent at a young age is loss. By changing and letting go and moving on, loss. American Psychiatric Society says from the top five stressful things we face in life, one of them is moving. Who would have thought that? is one of the top five stressful things people face. And the reason for that is loss. A loss of a home, a loss of security, a loss of familiar friends, a, a, a whatever, however you attribute that loss. That's why military children and sometimes have difficult times because they never really settle in one place for very long. They never have long-term relationships which build security in them. So it makes a, it builds this, this, this almost this... Um, Lone Ranger, afraid to get close to anybody, afraid to engage in a long-term relationship because I'm just going to move. That's a form of loss. Our losses include not only our separations and departures from those we love, but our loss of romantic dreams. Oh, impossible expectations. Illusions of freedom and power. Illusions of safety. Illusions of age. Who got old quickly? <laughs> Look at that. It happened like overnight, didn't it? You were, just yesterday you were young. 
Yeah, yeah, 20. Yes, yesterday. Yesterday he was 20 years old. And now I look at him and say, look at him. He's 22. <laughs> and, and, and he's, um, and just yesterday we were young. And, but when I was young, I had tomorrow, didn't I? At young, I still had time to make my fortune. At, when I was young, I still had time to pursue my dreams. When I was young, I still had time to get the perfect relationship. When I, when I was young, I had my future in front of me. And when I was young, I could fix anything that I screwed up so far. Then I wake up one day, it's just the one day between young and old, or older. <laughs> old is really anything over 55, but there is that, uh, I'm kidding, just kidding, just kidding. I'm 54 to tomorrow. <laughs> and um, that, that gets moved up a year every year, by the way. I'll be, I'll be 82. Yeah, anyone 83 is old. <laughs> and, um, but, and, but I look back, now I look and go, well, you know what, I, I don't know, maybe I'm 50 and I just lost my job. I don't know if I can start over. I don't know if I have the, 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 the hooks for the start over. I don't know if my, my country will even accept me in the workforce. I don't know if I can start over. That's loss. Sibling, the loss of sibling, the loss of parents, the loss of children at any age. Some of you know my dear friend Randy. Uh, he posted me on Facebook this week, Randy, um, he, um, Randy has a cerebral palsy. He's a great kid, and he's been with our church for many years. He lost his, his dog this past week. He had to put his dog down. And, um, and this, if you knew Randy and his dog, they were the best friends. I mean, the best of friends. And, um, and Randy was devastated after putting – I had to put a dog down. That was hard. But for Randy, I imagine it was, you know, it was, it was excruciating to put this dog down. This is his best friend, his only child. It was his companion for, for the whatever, 13, 14 years this, this dog lived. That's real loss. You, may, you and I may look at that and say, yeah, well, we all lose pets. But for him, it's different, wasn't it? So we can't ever judge each other's losses. I will never play for the Boston Red Sox. I will probably have to, at this stage in my life, probably have to settle for a lesser team like the Yankees or the Rays or, 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 something, or something like that. I probably I still have the talent level for them, but, but not for the Red Sox. I'll have to settle out or something. So that, that's loss. That's also a lot of Facebook activity I just created for, 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 for myself. <laughs> so there's loss. The next thing we have is called crisis. Crisis. Crisis is, is described as one step away from trauma. It goes hand in hand with loss. It's a result of loss. Because of loss, we face a crisis. The word crisis simply means turning point. Now, that doesn't necessarily always be bad, because sometimes if you have a marital crisis, that marital crisis, that means that your marriage is brought to a pinnacle, a place where you can go this way or that way. Now, hopefully it goes the right way. But sometimes that, that, that turning point, that crisis, is a very positive thing. Sometimes, sometimes it comes to a place where you're saying, wait, I just can't go on like this anymore. Something needs to change. There's an event that has taken place. I have to adjust something. If this relationship is going to make it, then I have to make the right decisions right now and choices right now in here to make this relationship make it. That's a crisis. It's a turning point. Decisions in a point of crisis are, could direct and, and deeply impact the rest of your life and what's going to happen with the rest of your life. In the midst of a crisis, anxiety and depression um, increases, tension increases. It could involve a temporary loss of coping abilities. Even though this emotional dysfunction in a crisis is reversible, it usually fixes itself. And again, embed, embedded in this is a embedded in this term crisis is also the understanding of an opportunity. So loss oftentimes will bring us to a point of crisis. But then we have this third thing called trauma. I want to share with you a little bit about this. Excuse me, there's allergies. Trauma is. Um, not everyone in life is going to have trauma. Let me just say that. Many will. I would say most will to some point. 
sitting with a dying parent as they ebb away with cancer for three or four or five months and, and doing all the home health care is traumatizing. Being in a business and watching your business go down the tubes and watching all your family security be um, go down the drain and eliminate it right before your eyes and you can't turn it around for some would be traumatizing, especially if you have kids at home that are dependent upon you. Trauma is defined as any, the response to any event that shatters your safe world so that it is no longer a place of refuge. Trauma is a game changer. Trauma is more than a state of crisis. It is the normal reaction to abnormal events. I say that again. It is a normal reaction to abnormal events. Usually trauma is placed around an event, something that happens. It overwhelms then the person's ability to adapt to life where they feel powerless. The word trauma comes from a Greek word that means wound. And that's exactly what it is, a wound. In the Wednesday night series, we'll be sh starting this Wednesday and the subsequent weeks. I'm actually going to show you pictures of the human brain, diagrams of the brain and what happens when trauma takes place so you really understand this physiological because it's a physiological event that trauma takes place. Here's a quote by Norman Wright's book um, in, in, on, on, on trauma. He defines it. Trauma changes all proper brain functioning. Please believe what I'm about to tell you. Let, let me just back up a, a moment. I'm a little old school in my approach to these things. I'm the guy that could say, ah, just get busy. I'm that guy. I ignore your pain. That's, that's my, that's that. That's, that's, I'm him. I'm that guy. Oh, I understand, but sometimes you just get to buck up, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and buck it up and go on. I'm that guy. I should say that. I was that guy. Until trauma invaded my life. And I realized that I have no ability to do what I thought people could do. So please, the things I'm about to share you are just trees. My understanding of the trees, of the forest that I'm in. It is the wounding of the brain it overwhelms the normal adaptations to life. It is not just an emotional response to troubling events. It is the expression of persistent deregulation of body chemistry. We're talking about physical changes. And but brain chemistry can be altered for decades. With this change, arousing events can trigger flashbacks. Three people in our church have had flashbacks from what happened February 12th in the Bay. Trauma creates chaos in our brain and causes an emotional as well as cognitive concussion. Entering the world of trauma is like looking into a fractured looking glass. The familiar angle, uh, the familiar appears disjointed and disturbing and a strange new world unfolds. You've all heard of post-traumatic stress syndrome that our soldiers go through. Some of you have maybe have experienced that or know family members that have experienced that. It is very real. It's when your brain sees things, your eye sees things your brain can't process. It's when you experience something that your, your, your mind is just too big for your mind and your mind will actually shut things out and shut down. It changes the chemistry, physical chemistry of your brain. I contacted H. Norman Wright. Some of you know Norman, Dr. Wright. He wrote a, a zillion books on counseling. He's, he was the one that called in for September 11th counseling. Um, he oversaw all the counseling for the, for the September 11th victims. He oversaw all the counseling for the Columbine shooting, um, the Ohio church shooting, and everywhere there's a trauma. He's the guy they call in to oversee the counseling for that. I went to his website. I have them in my textbooks. I found my wife reading his textbooks 
um, and being blessed by them and helped by reading his textbooks. So I thought, I'm going to see what else he has out there and because I had 30 hours of crisis and grief counseling just a year ago of training in my, in my schooling, which um, I forgot right after I took the test. And so I found his website, hnormanwright.com, and I, I said, contact us. So I sent the dog, hey, could, could, could uh, this, my name is such and such, and this is what happened to me. And here's a few news releases, and you can see and read the story. And, and um, is Dr. Wright available for any personal counseling? And, and um, 24 hours later, he called me. He's in California. I talked to him for about 40 minutes. My wife's going to talk to him soon. I'm trying to arrange that. He's open to talk to my wife, too. First thing he said to me, he said, Pastor, and first one, he's the one recommended I preach this message for you guys. He said, Pastor, your brain's been tattooed. Something's happened to you that you can't reverse and you can't change. It doesn't heal. You learn how to live differently. You learn, you learn to live, like we said months ago, maybe with more of a limb. It's when you experience an event or a prolonged state of great stress, war, sick loved ones. It can be a bad car wreck. Giving birth to a child that isn't alive. Remembering an abortion when you were younger that you wish you could forget changes your brain and you don't really you're not the same necessarily person that you were before now I sort of thought that I could grieve for a few weeks and pick up and move on and 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 sort of get back to my schedule and on on September 11th I was in writing a master's thesis I'm a recovery program from an exchange life program, I, and I was in a, an apologetics class ready to graduate in May. I was preaching Wednesdays and Sundays and doing lots of marriage counseling and being a dad and a, and a, and a husband and stuff, just sort of life, but very busy, and I couldn't, my, my brain couldn't handle it. Excuse me. Could you remove all pollen from this room? <laughs> September 12th came. And everything changed. I, um, my brain changed. I became a different person. I didn't think the same. My capacity was depleted. My ability to concentrate was um, challenged. I could come back five weeks later and focus and prepare a message and speak a message and be public, but sometimes after that it would be just exhausting. <laughs> Busy scenes with loss of activity um, would be overwhelming to me. I couldn't do what I used to do, and I couldn't just get over it. I'm not alone. If you've experienced maybe something September 12th yourself, I'm sorry, um, February 12th yourself, maybe you've experienced some of these things. Physical things change. Anger can seethe under the radar. I'm not an angry person. And I find myself getting angry at anything, not just the TV. Not just the Yankees. I found myself getting angry at drivers. I found myself getting, well, I don't know that's easy to do, but I found myself getting, getting angry at things that people would do or say where, where anger was never even part of my personality makeup, even before I met Christ. I was never an angry person. And now I had this subtle anger. It's all part of it. Depression. I've never been depressed. Now I battle depression. I don't take anything for it. It usually comes and goes. I was in Starbucks, my other office. Actually, my only office. I really don't have another one but that one. And it was about 2.30 in the afternoon. I think it was Thursday. I think it was. And, and I'm studying, and I'm trying to put together this, this morning's message, and I'm researching and reading stuff. And all of a sudden, I just hit a mental wall. I, I, I looked at my books. I looked at my computer screen. and. 
and I just I couldn't think anymore. And I, I packed up my stuff. I went home and laid down. That's never happened to me before. That's what trauma does. You lose mental and physical stamina, empathy for others. Somebody asked me for counseling recently, and I and I on uh, via the mail, and I just said I I'll be happy to talk to you, and I and I am really am. I don't want to. Please know, I'm not making myself a victim here. I'm really not. I'm trying to give you a snapshot. Because hopefully what I'm experiencing, some of you have already experienced or you might experience someday in the course of your life. And I want to give you, I want to teach you on these so you understand. Or maybe if you have never experienced this and maybe you never will, but you might be standing next to somebody who has. And you'll understand what they're going through and you'll be able to give them grace and space and mercy, mercy for them to heal. Do you lose empathy? I told this, this man is a dear friend. He says, I'm having these issues. Can you counsel me? And I, I said, well, I can always have a conversation with you and give you wisdom. But for me to tell you I'm going to counsel you over the next six weeks and meet you over the next six weeks, I can't do that. Because I can't. I would be lying to you if I promised you I could do it. I just don't know if I can do that. Because I could say this on a, on a Sunday. Yeah, I'll meet you Tuesday. But Tuesday may come along and I may be just zombied. Is it getting better, Pastor? Yeah, it's getting better. Getting better. Norman Wright told me, he goes, you'll be, um, he goes, Pastor, you're, you're probably looking at, a, at about a five-year recovery time. Before you sense life, you have the full capacity back and life is going on as you can handle things in life. You'll be about five years. He goes, your wife? Probably ten. Your daughter? She's going to be a late teenager, early 20s, before she resolves these issues. That's what six-year-olds do when they're traumatized. It hides and comes out where you least expect it, and you very rarely tie it back to the event. You get overwhelmed easily even when you've never been overwhelmed your whole life. You feel hopelessly weak when you've never been weak. Crying is unpredictable and frequent. You become, as I put in my notes, a walking button. Doesn't mean anything. You can be in a grocery store and look at the groceries you lost, your loved one who you love and you lost, and there's the groceries you used to buy for them and what they used to eat, and there's a blip, someone pushes your button. Tears fill your eyes. I'll sit across with people sometimes, and, and I know they get uncomfortable, but I can't stop it because I'll just talk about it. I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more about that later. Sleeping becomes erratic. There's been times I've gone days without sleep and these images come into your mind and you just can't get them out. Your mind replays images. It's like, it's like an ongoing movie. A power, in my case, a PowerPoint. Some like video for some. For me, it's still shots of the Bay, February 12th. The hospital, ICU. They just replay in the mind, replay in the mind, replay in the mind, and you can't shut them down. You try to shut them down. You pray they don't shut down because they've been tattooed there. The next night, they may not happen. Again, I'm not looking for sympathy. I'm not. But you'll meet somebody who lost a loved one in a car wreck, who was in a car wreck, who's been to war, Please know what, it, what I'm telling you and what they're telling you is true. Physical changes. You sweat more. I never knew that. But I noticed I was sweating. I, why am I sweating so much? I read it. That's why. You lose weight. My wife, Peggy, who weighed 105 when I married her, made 105 February 11th. Lost 15 pounds. She put some more on. I'm helping her in a ministry to my wife by eating ice cream every night. <laughs> Come on, honey. I want to minister to you. Get the, get the um, moose track ice cream out. we got to have another spoon. You can't finish that, honey? Well, let me help you. <laughs> Just because I want to be a good husband. <laughs> and she's putting weight back on. It's beginning to get better. Your brain begins to activate you to danger when there is no danger. 
I don't want to scare those in the car with me a few days ago. I won't tell you who you were, but I was driving, I was driving in a car with numerous people a few days ago, and I was all of a sudden gripped with fear that I was going to be in a car accident and everyone was going to die. And I was thinking, boy, I don't have my estate ready. I don't have the will changed. I don't have, I don't have all the proper things in place. This can't happen. And I remember holding the steering wheel, gripping it, and, and gripped with fear. That doesn't never happen to me before. No one in the car knew what was going on. I did, obviously. Didn't tell anyone we're all going to die in a fiery crash. <laughs> Didn't want them to be alarmed. <laughs> and we made it. But this is what happens. You think something's going to happen when it doesn't. You forget details of the trauma, and sometimes your brain deletes them or at least protects them, hides them to protect you. What well, some have shared with me, I've actually asked many people, please don't share anything more with me. I don't really want to talk about what happened February 12th because I have my own memory of that, and maybe a part of my recovery will be hearing the whole story, but right now my brain has just shut some of that right out. So let me just live amongst my trees for a while. If I feel the need to educate myself, I will. The left side of your brain and the right side of your brain, if you have both, that's a joke, <laughs> they usually work hand in hand. In trauma, there's a disassociation. The left side and the right side stop communicating. One side is the side of information, the other side is the side of images. There's a, there's a disconnect between those sides in, in deep trauma. It becomes intrusive and in, interrupts your life. You lose mental capacity. You can't do what you used to do. You're easily disoriented. And people want you back to be normal. But they want you to be normal for their sakes. They want your life and their relationship with you to be what it was before the trauma. And my friends, it just can't be because everything's changed. What do you say to somebody like me or somebody you know who've lost a loved one or somebody who has gone through a traumatic event in their life? What do you say to them and what do you not say to them? Let me tell you what you don't say to them. Some of this actually comes from the Hospice Foundation. Don't start a sentence with at least. At least you can try to have another baby. At least you still have children. At least you still have each other. Now, if you said that, please understand. If you said to me, don't, oh, I said that to them, I'm so ashamed. I don't remember who said what to me. I don't remember yesterday. What was yesterday? It was a day, right? And I don't remember. My mind's like spaghetti. I, I've had, I've got 3,000 plus conversations, letters, emails, cards that have come in to me that I've read with all sorts of stuff that people have said, some good, bad, and ugly. Okay, So please know, this isn't coming from anger. I want this to be educational to you. Don't start a sentence with at least. Don't say time will heal this. Time won't heal it. You learn to live with it. Be careful how you throw around Romans 8.28 and other bumper stickers and slogans. I know Romans 8.28. I've known that one from the very beginning. I know all things work together for good. But the pain is real. The good doesn't eliminate the pain. The blessing doesn't take away the pain. It's not a lack of faith. It's not, it's not a, um, a, a lack of bib a piece of biblical ignorance. It's just loss. God wired us this way to grieve. We're talking more about grief on Wednesday. Look at the good that's come out of this. Couldn't God have done good without this? Did this have to happen for God to do good? Couldn't God have reached these people and my daughter be home tonight? Because if he had to take her to get them, I'm going to take them out. <laughs> if that's the if they're the reason, I'm taking them out. 
No, I won't. Don't worry. I'm under control. My therapist is helping me. <laughs> My wife won't let me do anything anyway. <clears throat> um, so God wants to work something into your life. That's another one. Okay, thank you for that. But um, am I that dumb? Am I that numb? Am I that evil that God would have to take my child to teach me something? There's no help in that. And again, please know, we've all, we've all said these things. God will do a great work through this, to find great work. Wisdom. Don't compare your loss with another's. Chances are they're not the same. A miscarriage, a loss of an infant, sibling, or parent, a marriage, a loss of a marriage, an abortion does not equal the loss of a 20-year-old, and a 20-year-old's loss doesn't equal that loss. We just make it's not wise to compare each other's loss. That's what I'm getting at. Every loss is different, must be processed and, and, and dealt with on, on, it, on its own. One of the things that's helped us the most, and I've been given many books. Well, I've got 15 books given to me in the last three, four months. One was sent just last week to me, the best one we've got yet. Never heard it before. It says, sit down, God, I'm angry. It was written by a pastor that lost his 17-year-old son excuse me, in a skiing accident. And I think it was last week. I got it a week before. And the son was skiing. He crashed into a, a pier, and he died of brain trauma a week later. The parallels between his story and his relationship with his son and our story and our Hannah was so am amazingly close. As he was being a pastor of a large church and, and, um, and having the public and the, f and the media and everything else, it was an amazing story. And reading how he processed this and how he went on with his ministry and went on in his life, we found it extremely helpful and healing. But that was because he identified so closely with us. And let me tell you a secret about this man's book. He passed away in 2003. He wrote this book 19 years later. He didn't write it in the trees. He wrote it when he finally found his way out and wrote a map. And it was just as fresh to him then as it was. Don't minimize others' pains and say, look for the bright side. There's no bright side. I know there is, but I don't want to hear about it. I can just be honest. I'm, I'm in that line that way anyway. I know how you feel. No, you don't. It's part of God's plan. This is the one that hospice says makes more people, people angry than all the others. <laughs> it's part of God's plan. What plan? No one told me about a plan. Look at what you have to be thankful for. She's in a better place now. I know this. I'm grieving for me. This is behind you now. It's time to get on with your life. You have other children. One child can never replace another. Please understand that. I guess the Lord is trying to teach you something. Wow, well, I must be pretty dumb. <laughs> your loved one's in a better place. I agree, but her better place for me is right next to me. Let me just move on quickly because of time and we got baptism. This is what you say when you're next to somebody who's grieving, trauma, loss. This goes a long way. I love you. That just goes a long way. I said, I love you. I am so sorry. You don't have to explain anything. One pastor's wife from the city here, told my wife, and this really blessed her. She goes, anytime you need me, call me. I have a PhD in silence. Woman had wisdom. Somebody said this to us. It blessed us. When you grieve, I'll be grieving with you. I had a pastor friend call me. He goes, I'll be thinking about you and praying for you when you're not even thinking of me day and night. That meant a lot to me. A wordless, a wordless hug. 
a card that simply says, I grieve with you or stand with you. Meals, like so many of you produce all these wonderful meals. The problem with meals is you made enough food to feed most of the U.S. military. <laughs> and and you, you lose your appetite a little bit, <laughs> and so you'll have to eat this. <laughs> and um, gift cards, some beautiful gift cards to Carabas. Carabas is a healing thing in Carabas, and, and, and um, it's healing. <laughs> and then, then somebody gave me a gift card to Little Italy Pizza. I love them. <laughs> I love them. And, 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 but you know what? It helps because sometimes you'll have a gang of people at your house and, and you think, I got to cook. I, I got to. And you don't have the ability to do it. So you have, those, you have those cards. People that, that listen. And I'm going to close with this. This is my normal. This is my new normal. I don't know how long the tears will be so frequent. They'll probably diminish in months and weeks and months and years. They'll get less frequently. They're going to be there for a while. But I'll be sitting across here in Starbucks. I'll be sitting talking on the phone, and all of a sudden tears will well up my eyes, and I'll choke up. And, and, and I can see with many of you, you just smile, and you're quiet, and I appreciate that. Some put their hand on my shoulder, and I appreciate that. Some get very uncomfortable. I'm sorry. I don't want to make you uncomfortable. But please know, I can't change it. This is my normal. I'm grieving. I'm mourning. And it's going to come out somewhere, somehow. So you want to help somebody that mourns? Just be there. Don't expect them to be anything but somebody who is mourning. Don't expect them to be strong. Don't expect them to be anything for you. Just be there. And if they cry, cry with them or pray with them. Pray for them. If they weep, just stand there till they're done and keep talking. It's okay. It really is. That's their life. And this is their woods they have to pass through. They'll get through them. It's been millions upon millions of people have gone through them through the history of creation and will pass through it too like everyone else. But that's how you help people grieve. Very rarely, very few words have anything. Identification with them is worth more than volume.